Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, Luke has already introduced me, so I'm Phil. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about Apache Spark. Uh, to start with, just some brief introductions. So, um, as Luke said, I'm a principal engineer here at Bramwatch. I've been here for about three years. Um, in the past, I've had management um, roles. I've had sort of hands-on engineering roles um, for quite a long time. But what's kind of connected all these together has been working with large amounts of data, big data in the sort of buzzwordy parlance. Um, often at scale, so across multiple machines, doing machine learning, distributed machine learning, uh, those sort of things. Typically, you can find me using Java, Scala, and Python as my main tools, um, but I kind of tend to turn my hand to pretty much everything, except for JavaScript and PHP, uh, so don't ask me about those. Um, so who here has used Spark? Anybody? A couple of people? Yeah, okay. Who's used Hadoop? A couple more people? Mostly the same people. Not so surprising, I guess. So uh, about this talk, so I had to think about how to approach this quite, quite hard because um, people who use Spark will kind of understand where I'm coming from when I say that Spark is a very kind of complicated uh, beast. It's got a lot of APIs that do various things, APIs that do similar but distinct things. Um, so I could have spent 40 minutes just, you know, just rattling through some APIs and looking at some code, um, but I thought that would be quite boring. So instead, I'm going to approach it slightly differently. So I'm going to split this talk into three parts. The first part is going to be about kind of prehistory about Hadoop, MapReduce, uh, and more importantly, how you can apply some very simple patterns to build distributed data processing systems. Because although these patterns have been around for quite a long time, they're really relevant today, uh, and Spark has its own sort of twist and spin on them. And if you can understand how to apply these patterns and then understand how Spark works architecturally, you can then build upon that to kind of learn actually how the APIs work and how you can build your own systems. And I thought that would be a more profitable use of 40 minutes rather than just like looking at some sort of Java doc style stuff. So really what I want you to take away from this talk is an understanding of how you can kind of break complicated distributed systems down into kind of distinct components, simple distinct components that you can kind of combine and chain together, and then how Spark actually applies these in the real world. Um, but let's first start with a definition. So this word is obviously synonymous with Spark and Hadoop and all those sort of things, and that is the word big data, okay? So it's a buzzword, it's been around for a while, it means different things to different people. And the reason I'm talking about it is because I have a particular definition which is quite relevant to the way Spark works. And that definition is this one, okay? So data that is voluminous enough that the working set no longer fits onto the single host. And the really important part of this phrase is the middle part, so the part about the working set. Because, you know, modern storage is quite amazing, okay? I can get a huge hard drive, a huge RAID array, and I can plug it into this laptop. So the actual the amount of data is less important than what you do with it. Okay, that's the working set, right? So let's look at a simple example. So we can take eight terabytes of text files. I can put it on an external hard drive, you know, either an SSD RAID array or a spinny hard drive, plug it into here, and then I can do some stuff with it, okay? So we can take a really simple task, like counting the word cat, okay? This is trivial, okay? Probably the only thing that's gonna be a bottleneck is gonna be disk I.O. bandwidth. CPU, probably not. Uh, memory, almost definitely not, because you're just gonna keep a counter somewhere. So you can quite easily accomplish this task in maybe not minutes, but in a couple of hours, just on a simple laptop like this. But if you take that same eight terabyte of text files, and this time you switch up a bit, we make it a bit harder, we wanna count each unique word, so count how many times each unique word occurs, okay? Even though the data set is the same, the task is materially harder. Okay, so disk I.O. bandwidth is probably gonna be an issue still, but you're gonna be keeping a lot more data in memory, you're gonna to have to have some sort of map from you know, each individual word to accounts, and you're gonna to have to probably spend more CPU time actually working with that data. And it's quite probable that you know, with eight terabytes of text files, there are enough unique terms that, that that map from term to count doesn't actually fit in memory anymore. So it's suddenly become a much more difficult problem. Okay, and you can't really necessarily solve it on a simple, simple box like this. But there is one thing that connects both of these tasks, and that is that they are embarrassingly parallel. Okay? So Spark and Hadoop and systems like that work really well for problems that are embarrassingly parallel. And what this basically means is that there's a very simple, straightforward strategy that you can employ to split this task into chunks, which you can then operate on distinctly in isolation, and then maybe combine the results back later on. And that's kind of the key. Problems that require lots of shared state are much harder to work on, and you can kind of do them in things like Spark, but it's not the most efficient way necessarily. So we're going to look at embarrassingly parallel problems first. So I'm going to introduce something called MapReduce. Okay? This has been around for a long time. Um, it was really first formalized strongly and promoted by Google about, oh, about 10 years ago now, about a decade ago. Uh, the kind of canonical open source implementation of this is Hadoop, which I guess some of you have used. Um, and it's really sort of a very basic, very basic sort of four or five step process. So I'm going to just walk through this now with this, uh, some, some data on this board. 
So we're going to start with a very simple text file. It's just got two lines, and each line has four words. So dog, dog, fox, cat, and cat, fox, fox, fox. And the very first thing we need to do to work on this in parallel is work out how to split it into chunks. And if we can split it into chunks, then we begin to see how we can sort of work on it. So with a text file, right, this is easy because it's just got lines. For this particular task, so we're going to look at this unique um, word count problem, it's easy because you don't care about ordering, you don't care whether line one is processed before line two, it can all be looked at in complete isolation. So with our text file, we create something called a split, or we can create multiple splits just by cutting it up in lines. So with this simple two-line example, that's easy, just only two splits. But so you have eight terabytes of text files, maybe that's a million lines per split or a single file per split, whatever. But you find a way of, chuck, uh, of splitting this data up into individual chunks. So that's step one. Step two is something called mapping. And the basic idea here is if we can take a very simple function that takes an input tuple, so a tuple is just a list of values. In Hadoop, it's a key and a value. So in our example, maybe it's the line from the file uh, and the line number from the file, so the key and the value. And then it outputs a sequence of zero or more result tuples. Zero or more because you can obviously discard data. Um, so in our example here, we're going to take each line and we're going to split it into words and just consider each word in isolation because I don't care about the order here. It doesn't really matter that I look at maybe fox before dog. <coughs> Completely irrelevant. So we're just going to split it, tokenize it somehow, uh, in this case maybe split on white space, and then output a sequence of result tuples, which I'm going to try and use this laser pointer. So let's see if that works. Ooh, yeah, there we go. So in this case, each line has been split into four words. And the key of our tuple is the word, so dog, dog, fox, cat. And we're just using the number one as the value for the tuple. Okay? So we've gone from text file to a set of splits, uh, where each split being a line in this case, and then a sequence of tuples that's coming out of our map function. So you can probably begin to see how we can sort of start to get some unique counts at the end. So the very, very, very next stage is something called the shuffle. And what the shuffle does is it ensures that all of the tuples with the same key, so in this case, say, dog, are on the same physical box. Same for the word cat, same physical box, and all our foxes are in the same place as well. How that actually happens depends on the framework. Uh, if you're using something like Hadoop, it does it by writing it to disk or distributed file system. If you're using Spark, it sends it over the wire. But the actual mechanism is sort of irrelevant to this particular problem. So we just got now a sequence of tuples, um, but in the right place, so each tuple with the same key is in the same place. And the next step is called the reduce step, and this is the last part of the puzzle. So we want to go from a list of tuples like this to some final counts. And what reduce is, is it's basically another very simple function, and the function takes a key, so in this case, our word, and then a sequence of values. So in our case, this will be the, oops, the number one. So we take dog, and then it's a sequence of two ones, so the count is two. And we take cat, and it's a sequence of three ones, and the count is three. And we take fox, and again, a sequence of four ones, so the count is four. So it turns out that this fairly simple four-step process can actually be used to express most embarrassingly parallel problems. Um, and I've used the word simple quite a lot here. And it kind of is simple, right? It's just four steps. And so the basic idea, I guess, is simple. But the reality is, if you have a sophisticated problem, breaking it up into these little steps is actually quite hard. There's quite a lot of cognitive load. It's quite hard to keep that in your head, to work out what's going on. It's really hard to debug. Um, so yes, I kind of, it's, sort of, it's sort of simple. But when you're using it to build real-world systems, maybe not so much. Um, another thing that's important to realize is that optimization is pretty manual. So in this example here, you can kind of see maybe some optimizations you can do straight away. So rather than sending all of this data across the network, we could do some, like, some pre-reducing here on each box, for example. So there's lots of sort of strategies you could employ to optimize this, this workflow. But again, it's quite manual. You need to do it yourself, and you need to sort of be aware of the patterns to apply. So I guess the manifestation of this is what the code itself looks like. So this is how you do the word count example in Hadoop. Um, you hope you can see that at the back there. So up here we have a mapper, and we have a reducer, and you can sort of see the method signatures. So reduce takes a key, and then a sequence of values, and map takes a key and a value. Um, and there's obviously a lot of kind of Java-style boilerplate, but for like a very simple problem, this is already quite a lot of code. There's quite a lot going on here. So simple, yes and no. What about speed? So speed is quite important. You know, we're dealing with big data. We want to be able to process this problem quickly. We want to get some results in decent time. That's sort of the point of this exercise. Um, and again, the answer is it sort of depends. So for this example, yeah, this is pretty quick because you're not really sending any data around that you don't need to. But because Hadoop and MapReduce frameworks tend to think about operations purely as small, distinct chunks like this, 
lots of data gets shuffled around and sent around where it might not otherwise need to be. So this is the point at which we start to talk about Spark. So Spark is one of many solutions to this particular problem. Um, there are others out there. There's things like Flink, uh, which I know some of you here have used. Um, there are sort of layers that sit on top of Hadoop. Um, but Spark is obviously what we're here to talk about tonight. So Spark was started in 2009. Um, originally, it was designed to sit on top of Mesos. And Mesos is a cluster orchestration system. It's not designed to completely replace all of the Hadoop ecosystem. It's designed to replace MapReduce. So it can still use HDFS, which is the Hadoop distributed file system. It can still use all of the sort of input and output formats that Hadoop uses. Um, one of the really key things about Spark is because it's like a newer generation than Hadoop, is that it's been designed with modern hardware in mind. So when you sort of think about it, you can get boxes, server boxes that have got you know, up to a terabyte of RAM for you know, tens of thousands of dollars, low tens of thousands of dollars. In fact, we've just installed a new cluster here that's got two and a half terabytes of RAM and cost us less than 70,000 pounds. So in the old days, that would be you know, completely infeasible, but Spark is, is able to utilize this hardware much more efficiently than Hadoop and the sort of the older systems. Um, and this is very important when you think about doing, for example, iterative problems. So if you want to train the machine learning model and you need to go over your data a lot, in the Hadoop land, you're writing lots of stuff to disk and then loading it back off disk again, and that's very expensive. But Spark can keep things in memory and just make that whole process orders of magnitude faster. And one other key feature of Spark is that it's got a very high level API with like, a good level of abstraction. And this is quite important when you're trying to distill your kind of complicated problems into, into actual code. And it also means that Spark is able to perform kind of quite good high level optimizations, which you would otherwise have to do manually, which again, if you're trying to make stuff go fast, is pretty cool. So that's the sort of the theory. Uh, we're now actually gonna talk about the details of Spark itself. So the first thing to look at is the high level architecture. So from a high level, Spark is pretty simple, and I've just nicked this from the Spark website, so you, you may have seen this before if you've, uh, if you've been reading about it. So the three main components, over here we have the driver program, and this is basically where your business logic, logic lives. It's the thing that orchestrates the actual job itself. So when you write a Spark application, you write this little driver program, uh, and then this is the thing that's actually run on the cluster. Sitting in the middle here, we have the cluster manager. Um, Spark is actually pretty agnostic to cluster managers. It can run on Yarn, which is the Hadoop cluster manager. Uh, the latest version supports Kubernetes out of the box, which is quite cool as well. As I said before, it can run on Mesos. Um, and all the cluster manager does is basically ensures that these executors are running. And these executors are where the data itself is actually processed. So, so the Spark framework will take chunks of your code, computer closure, which is basically all the variables that your code needs to run, and then serialize it, and then send it to the executors to be run. So pretty simple from sort of a high level perspective. So let's drill into some of the details that kind of underpin this. And the first really important detail is something called the RDD. So this stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset, uh, and it's kind of like the lowest level of abstraction in Spark. And what it is basically is a partition collection of elements. So in our previous example, where we had our input splits, an RDD encompasses this data set. And an RDD is composed of one or more partitions, and a partition is just like a split. So in our word count example, maybe we have two partitions, one for each line. RDDs have some very interesting properties. Uh, and one of the, I guess, kind of counterintuitive ones is that they are immutable. So you can't actually change any data inside an RDD once you've created it. You can only transform it into a new RDD. So you can apply an operation to it, and they get a new RDD in response. This means they're deterministic. So you can apply the same function to an RDD multiple times and always get the same result, which is, which is quite cool. Um, they're reliable as well. So if I run a job on this laptop for 10 hours, OK, it's an Apple laptop. It's probably going to survive most times for 10 hours. Um, but if I run that same job on a cluster of 10,000 machines, there's a really good, high, very high probability that at least one of those machines is going to fail. And it's just the nature of the beast. Whether it's hardware failure, somebody kicks a network cable out, or whatever, you don't really want a single machine to fail and that to take down your entire job because you'd waste you know, thousands of hours of CPU time. So Spark can distribute around the data in an RDD multiple times and makes it resilient to hardware failure, which is really important when running at scale. So one other thing about RDDs is that they can be cached in memory. So you can say to Spark, I would like you to keep this data in memory at all times, or at least make a best effort to keep it in memory at all times, which is what allows you to do you know, things like training machine learning models in, in good time. So RDDs can be transformed, as I said. So in the word count example, we can transform an RDD of lines to an RDD of these tuples. And this is just a transformation. And this is all lazy. So Spark doesn't actually do any computation until you perform an action. And what an action is, uh, for people that are familiar with Java, is quite similar to a terminating operation in the Java Streams API. It basically says to Spark, I actually now need this data. I would like you to either compute it and write it to disk, <coughs> excuse me, or compute it and bring it back to the driver, but actually materialize these views. 
So we have actions and we have transformations, we have RDDs. There are two types of transformation, which are quite important to understand. Um, and I will walk through all these concepts when we actually start looking at some code in a second. So the first is a narrow transformation. And this is basically when you don't need to move data around the network. So in our word count example, this might be filtering out some words. Maybe I just don't like cats. I want to filter out the word cat. So this can be done using a narrow transformation. So no data needs to be sent around the network. Each partition can be, can be worked on in isolation. The next type of transformation <coughs> excuse me, is the wide transformation. And the wide transformation does require data to be sent around the network. So in our word count example, that very last step where we're going over the sequence of tuples, that requires a wide transformation. OK, so we have actions, we have transformations, we have RDDs. The thing that ties all of these together um, really is the sort of the magic underneath the covers is something called the DAG, or the Directed Acyclic Graph. Um, and what this basically is, <coughs> excuse me, Oops. Yes, that serves me right for eating pizza before this talk. Um, what, what the DAG basically is, is uh, a sequence of operations um, which are tied together with the dependencies. And this is a very simple DAG which describes the word count example. Um, and I'm going to walk through the code for this in a minute and show you how this is all built up. So the very last part before we start talking about kind of code itself is how data flows through a Spark system. So it's pretty simple, actually. So the driver itself tends to not interact with the underlying data. Bits of code get sent around to executors, and the driver might tell executors what to do, but it typically doesn't talk to the underlying data. It's the executors that talk to the underlying data source. So when it's reading and writing data, putting it to and from, this is all happening executed to data store. And a data store could be anything. It could be Hadoop's distributed file system, HFS. It could be S3. It could be Google Cloud Storage. It could be Elasticsearch. It could be Kafka. There's a whole variety of input and output formats. Um, but it's always the executors that are talking to those. So. That's sort of the architecture. Let's start talking about some APIs. So I'm going to talk through two, type, two main types of API in Spark. Um, so the first one, is just oops, first one is just direct RDD access. So this is the, like the lowest level of API. If you've used the kind of the Scala collection API or the Java collection API, it's very similar. So you kind of just perform mapping and flat maps and filters and those sort of things. Um, it's quite useful when you're dealing with unstructured data. Uh, so if you've got like an opaque blob of binary data that you want to do something with. Um, subjectively, some people find it easier to express algorithms using functional programming constructs. Um, that's quite subjective. You know, some people just don't like SQL and SQL style operations. Um, so you can find it easier in, in RDD land. Um, but one thing to be really aware of is because this is the, low, the lowest level Spark API, uh, it's not able to optimize things as well. So Spark has an optimizer that tries to make things go fast. And because you know, there's a lower level of abstraction, it's less able to do that with RDDs. So the second type of APIs, and the ones that I suggest that you start with, <coughs> excuse me, are the data frame and data set API. So this is what I would recommend you start with and use in most cases. These are column orientated. Um, there's a schema associated with the data. Um, conceptually, uh, data frames are quite similar to tables in relational databases. So if you're sort of familiar with you know, writing SQL and those sort of things, the concepts will come very naturally. In Spark 2, they're actually built upon the same thing. Um, and actually, data frames are just untyped data sets. Underneath, they're still using RDDs, but there's a kind of like a higher level of abstraction on top. So that's the end of the sort of the dry talking. That's the, the data frames, the APIs, the, uh, the underlying architecture. We're now going to enter the danger zone, so we're going to actually do some live coding. I've tried to make this as robust as possible, so hopefully it'll go fine. Um, this point is probably a good time to talk about actually how you run Spark jobs. So there's two main ways of doing it. The first way is to create a fat jar, which is basically a jar file that's got your code and all of the dependency code in it as well. And then you just submit that to your cluster. And that's typically how you do things in production. But it's pretty laborious. You have to compile a fat jar. You have to copy it somewhere. You have to run it. It takes time. Anybody that's used J2EE and WebSphere and those sort of things remembers the bad old days. And it's kind of like that. Um, so the alternative when you're sort of building prototypes and you're uh, you know, sort of, you know, working with your, your original initial system is to use either a REPL or a notebook. And at this point, I'm going to exit from my presentation. Ooh, that's worked OK. OK, so OK, I'm now looking at this screen, if you wonder why I'm not looking at you guys, because uh, this is where my code is. So anybody that's used Scala, who's used Scala? Anybody here? Yeah, those of you, right. This is the Scala REPL with some Spark stuff injected into it. If you download Spark from the Spark website, in the bin directory, there's Spark shell. And that's exactly what this is. So you can just do Spark stuff uh, and Scala stuff like you normally would. I can. Oh, it's tiny, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll change the font size. That's a very good point. Oops. Do, do, 
do 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 what size do you reckon? 18, is that good? A bit bigger? 36, how's that? Yeah, okay, cool. I'm not actually going to do very much typing in here, so actually this is, that was sort of pointless, but at least you can read it now. Um, so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see what I wrote earlier to test it. Sorry, Luke. <laughs> um, so there are two variables that are injected into here. So you have something called SC, which stands for Spark Context, and that's one of the Spark APIs, and you have uh, Spark, which is the Spark session, and you can just call methods on this. Um, but I'm not going to use this because, A, it's quite hard to read, and it's not particularly user-friendly. Uh, so instead, I'm going to use this thing called Apache Zeppelin, uh, and I'll make those fonts bigger as well. Do, do, do. Big enough? Bigger? Smaller? Bigger? Okay. You see at the back? Yeah? Okay, cool. So what Zeppelin is, is basically a notebook application. And you, some of you might have seen um, Jupyter Notebook before. And it's the same sort of thing, um, one of the kind of competing projects. Uh, and the reason why I'm using this is that it's got much better Scala and Java support. So it's kind of better for this, this example. Um, I am going to write some Scala code. Um, and the main reason for that is that Spark at the moment relies on Scala 2.11. And Scala 2.11 doesn't have perfect support for Java Lambdas. So you can write perfectly functional Scala code in uh, sorry, Spark code in Java. But it tends to be, you know, there tends to be quite a lot of typecasting and sort of Java boilerplate. At some point in the hopefully not too distant future, Spark will support Scala 2.12, and then it's much more seamless, and you can write perfectly clear uh, Spark jobs in Java. So what I've done is I've downloaded some text from the internet. So we're going to do the word count example and then add some more functionality to it. So I've downloaded David Copperfield from Project Gutenberg, which is here, and this is just plain text, UTF-8. Nothing very special about that at all. Um, so the very first thing to do is to get this into our application. So we have SC, which stands for Spark Context. And I've just said, I'd like to load this text file. And it does just that. So if we run that, I get back an RDD. And the RDD is typed. And the type is just a single type of string. So it's a sequence of lines by default. Um, this is lazily computed as well. So at this point, Spark hasn't actually done any real work. It's just said. Yeah, that file appears to exist, and it looks like it's a text file. So yeah, here's a pretend RDD that might contain that data. And if we look at the Spark UI, and this is a quite a useful web app that ships with Spark, you can see that it's completely empty at this point in time. But if I actually make Spark do something, and I'm going to use an action here, and the action is take, and take basi basically just takes a number of items from the RDD. So I'm going to run that. And that forces Spark to actually evaluate this RDD. And you can see, yeah, this looks like Project Gutenberg text. Um, the Project Gutenberg book of David Copperfield. Fantastic. But if we look at the Spark UI, we can see that we have a job that's now just run. Um, and if we look inside it, we can see this DAG visualization. Okay, so I hope this looks familiar from before. You can see we're just doing one thing here. We're loading a text file and we're taking the top five items. And Spark's able to perform a bit of optimization. It knows that it only needs to read the first 64K to actually to do that. Um, so it's a very small optimization. OK, so let's add some more functionality. So the first thing to do is to take these lines and split them into words, just like in the Hadoop word, word, uh, word count example. So we're going to use flat map. And flat map basically does exactly what it says on the tin. It takes the output from this function, so this line.split, which is a sequence of strings, and it just smashes all of those together into one big list. So we'll run that, like so. Again, this is lazy, so it's not actually doing any work. And if we look at the... Spark job UI, nothing's happened. Nothing new has happened, at least. Uh, but if we take the first five words by running that, we get the Project Gutenberg ebook of, which is indeed the beginning f first five words. And if we look inside the job UI, you can see there's a new job. And we can see our DAG has got slightly more complicated. So there's now a flat map in here. But this is still a narrow transformation. So it's able to do that without sending any data around the network. OK, cool. So. Let's just see how many words we've got in there. So the Spark RDDs uh, API has lots and lots of methods to do lots and lots of things, which is both a blessing and a curse. And it's a blessing because there's loads of functionality, and it's a curse because the API itself is pretty complicated. So we'll count that. So there's 367,000 words in David Copperfield. Sounds about right, I guess. But this data is quite, di quite dirty. So we don't really care about case sensitivity. Uh, punctuation isn't very important. So let's just clean it up a bit. So we're going to apply some more transformations to, the, to these RDDs. So we're, first of all, we're going to make all the text lowercase. These are just strings, so we just use the Scala and Java to lowercase function. 
We're then going to replace all the punctuation, because I don't care about that, so I'm just going to throw it in the bin. So I'm just using a simple regular expression here to do that. Then I'm going to just trim off any trailing or leading white space uh, that might be left because of that. And then finally, I'm going to throw away any words that have zero length, because maybe they were just punctuation. Uh, so that can go in the bin. Don't need that anymore. Uh, and the very last thing is to turn it into a tuple. So this is the Scala syntax for a tuple. And remember, a tuple is just a list of values. Um, and just like the Hadoop example, we're taking the word as the key and the number one as the value. So I run that again, like so. Here we go. It's given me a new partition, a new map, a uh, new RDD. Um, so if we take the first five words, we'll see that we have some tuples, and they're all lowercase. That looks pretty good. So one thing to notice is that throughout this set of uh, operations, the order has been the same. Okay, so the very beginning we had the project Gutenberg Ebukov, blah blah blah. And then we took the first five words after, after turning it into words, and it remains the same. And then same for this step after the cleaning up. And this is a really clear indication this is a narrow transformation. So all these things have been pipelined together and then have been applied to the same underlying RDD. And again, if you look at our job, we'll see that there's quite a lot of them here now. Okay? But these are all narrow, so these are all really efficient and executed really quickly. So let's do the last part of this exercise. Um, actually, let's just first count them. So let's see how many words we now have. There's a few less, 357,000. So we've thrown away 10,000 nonsense words. Um, so let's just get the counts. Um, and this reduce by key is one way of doing that. So one of the other things you might notice when you start to use Spark is that there are lots of ways of doing the same thing. Um, so something as simple as counting things, there are three or four different ways of doing it. Um, and there are different implica implica implications for using different ways of doing it. So one thing you could do is use something called the group by function, which seems quite naturally what you want to do. It groups all the data together and gives you a sequence of values you can work on. But that's actually quite expensive to do because it tends to ship lots of data around. So what reduce by key does is it operates, it executes this little lambda, this little function in here, against the data on each node and then ships the results across the network. So that's obviously more efficient than sending all of the data. So we'll just run that. And again, this is lazy. This is a transformation. This is a wide transformation, but it's still lazy. But if we take the first five words with the counts, we will see. OK, so we've got some different data now. So we've got Experientia with a count of one, Bachelor with a count of three. Um, so clearly, our function has done something. Um, and if we look at the Spark UI, we will see that things have changed a bit. OK, so we've, we've done this, this reduce by key. And this is a wide transformation, so we have this new stage. And this is an indication that data has been sent across the network. OK, so let's get the most common words. Um, so I'm guessing the most common words are probably going to be things like it and 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 of, and sort of the filler words. Uh, but let's just confirm that. So there's a sort by method. It kind of does what it says on the tin. You pass in the thing you want to sort it by, so the second value in the tuple, which is the counts. Uh, and we're going to sort it descending, because we want the, want the most um, common ones to appear at the top. So we'll run that again. Lazy, lazy transformation. Another wide transformation. Um, and then we'll do an action, make Spark actually execute that. OK, so yeah, that's completely unsurprising. So the, I, and, or, and to, and of are the most common words in David Copperfield. Could never have predicted that. Um, but if we look at the job UI, we will see in the latest job, some interesting things. So as I said, sort by is a wide transformation, because to sort, you need to send data around. Um, but Spark has skipped this particular. We back? Yeah, good. OK. So Spark has not had to recompute this data. It's been able to reuse data from the previous step, um, which is, again, another um, optimization it's able to do. Um, when you cut a prototype in like that, that's pretty cool, because you don't need to recompute all the preceding steps. OK, last thing here in the RDD API uh, is to get rid of the stop words. So stop words are uh, words that, for whatever reason, we don't care about. Uh, maybe they're just filler words that occur too frequently to convey any useful information. There are lots of ways of getting rid of stop words. Personally, I tend to use statistical-based approaches, but that's a bit long-winded. So what I've done is download a list of useless words from the internet, which you can see kind of there. It's just a list of words in a text file. Not very interesting. Um, but I'm going to actually use this to introduce a final piece of Spark functionality, and that's something called broadcast variables. So sometimes it's really useful to be able to send data from your driver to the executors. And again, in Spark, there are several ways of doing it. But one way is to use a broadcast variable. And that's basically where you say to Spark, I'd like you to take this data 
and I'd like you to just transparently ship that across the network and ship it to all the executors so they can, they, you know, they can access it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to load this stop word text, just using some basic Scala, um, and turn it into a set. So I'll run that. And you'll see here we have a list of stop words, the sort of words you would expect me to sort of want to drop in the bin. Um, and then I'm going to just broadcast those to all the executors. So I mean, again, I'm using this broadcast function. And I'm just going to run it. Off it goes. Um, one thing to bear in mind is the data that you broadcast has to be serializable. If it's not serializable, Spark will get very angry and break. Uh, and the very last thing to do is just to remove those stop words from the sorted data. So what I'm doing here is saying if this word, if the word in this RDD is not in the is is in the um, broadcast stop words list, I want you to just drop it on the floor. So we'll run that. Again, that's lazy, um, but we're going to perform an action. We're going to take what should be the top 10 words that should look a little more interesting than the pre preceding ones. So we'll run that. And yeah, so little aunt, Macaiba, Miss Peggotty, time, hand, head, dear, traddles. Bit more interesting, bit more kind of David Copperfieldy. So that's the RDD API. Um, as I said, anybody that's used the Spark, uh, sorry, the Scala collections API should be very familiar with this. It's a very sort of natural way of working. But the other option, as I said before, is the data frame and the uh, data set API. So I'm going to load this notebook. Yep, good. So what I've done is I've downloaded some JSON from our Twitter archive. Um, it's just about 30 seconds of Twitter. So there's about 50,000 50, um, messages in there. Uh, and it kind of looks like this. So it's pretty verbose, pretty deeply nested JSON. Um, there's one squashed JSON object per line in this file, as it happens. Uh, but you can see there's like, loads of stuff in here. So when you're working with this sort of data, it's really useful to have a schema. So I like to be able to access you know, something that's deeply nested just by kind of dereferencing down. Uh, down you know, if I want to get expanded URL, I can just do gnip.urls.expandedurl. I don't want to have to like, write little parsers to parse this data. And one of the really cool things about the data frame and dataset API is that Spark is able to infer a schema. Okay? So I don't even need to specify a schema. I'm going to say to Spark, this is some structured data. Uh, I'd like you to go and look at it and then work out how it's, how it's uh, structured and what the schema looks like. So we'll run that. And this works with a variety of different data types. So if you've got CSV with headers, it'll use the headers to work out what the columns are. If you've got JSON, it'll sample some of the JSON records and work out you know, exactly what the schema looks like. Um, so here I've created a data frame. I've counted it, so there are 46,000 records in here. Um, if we actually look at the schema it's inferred with this print schema function, we'll see that um, it looks pretty faithful to JSON. So we have an actor, there's a display name, favorites count. And if we look at the JSON, somewhere up here, uh, yep, we have an actor, we have a display name, you know, friends count, favorites count, that sort of thing. So it's done a pretty good job of inferring what that schema looks like. And because it's done that, I can now actually start referencing bits of data by using you know, simple, obvious field names like this. So let's say, for example, we want to group together all of the tweets that have been sent by the same people. Um, we just use the group by method, and we pass in the field actor.id. So we'll do that, like so. Uh, and we get back this thing called a relational group data set, which is like a group by query in, in SQL. And then maybe you want to find the most prolific authors in this data set. Uh, so we'll do that by just by applying this count function, which basically counts the, the groups, and then sort it to find the most numerous groups first, and then just take the first 10 just to see what it looks like. And there we go. OK, so this person, in about 30 seconds, managed to tweet 24 times. And I was actually intrigued by that, so I actually went and had a look at this guy, and he was actually really, really angry. Um, so it, was actually, it is actually a, a real result. Uh, crazy people on the internet, what can you do? Um, <laughs> the one last thing, to, just, to, just to demonstrate this a bit further, is um, so there's this thing called a generator. And in Twitter parlance, that's the actual app that's been used to send the, um, send the tweet. So what we're going to do is just group together all the generator names and then just find the most common application used to send tweets in this data set. You won't be surprised by the results. But we'll look at it anyway. Yeah, there we go. So uh, the most common application used to send tweets on Twitter is Twitter for iPhone. Um, what a surprise. Uh, Twitter for Android is second, and there's some other clients that come, come afterwards. But I hope this very simple example shows that you can take you know, really rich, nested, deeply structured data, uh, throw it at Spark, and then manipulate it in a really sort of sensible way just by using these high-level operations. 
Um, and one of the final things to look at before we switch back to the presentation is what that actually looks like in the job UI, because it's a little different. So I mentioned before that Spark is able to, with this sort of high-level API, do much better with optimization. So you tend to see these things quite a lot, so these whole stage code gens and these exchanges. And this is basically Spark compiling your code, uh, looking at it, pulling it apart, and working out how to, how to execute in the most optimal way, which is kind of cool, but it does make this DAG a little less useful because it's a little less obvious what's going on, although you can click through and see you know, exactly which line is resulting in which operation. So those are the APIs. I'm going to switch back to my presentation so that this works. Yeah, very good. Okay, cool. So those are the main kind of data manipulation APIs. There are some other APIs to be aware of. Um, I'll just name them and briefly describe them. So there's something called GraphX, which is a graph API. So if you want to compute page rank or centrality or some sort of graph API uh, style thing, GraphX is the way to do it. We use it here to compute influence over billions of edges in an influence graph. Uh, there's a direct SQL implementation, so you could actually connect to your Spark cluster using JDBC or ODBC and kind of query it that way, which is quite cool if you like SQL. Uh, there's something called MLlib, which is a distributed machine learning library. Um, and then there's a sort of a streaming API that sits on top of this. And the streaming API uses all the same underlying kind of like RDD and dataset APIs, but does little batches of data, so you can kind of create streaming, streaming uh, systems, which is quite cool. So it might sound like I'm really enthusiastic about Spark, um, and I guess I kind of am. I've been around long enough that I used to use Hadoop, and Spark is just night and day better. Um, but <laughs> it's not all great, okay? It really isn't all great. And I'm going to quote somebody actually who's in this room who said something yesterday that really resonated, and that's interactions with Spark often start with good intentions but often end up in regret. And the reality is that Spark is putting a really nice API over something that is actually still quite complex and inherently quite difficult. And you can, for example, run a job on your local system and it'll work fine, and then you'll take that same job and you'll run it in a cluster of many machines and much more data, and it'll fail in ways that you wouldn't really have predicted. Um, which is sort of understandable, because I said, you know, it is still doing something that's quite complex, but it can be quite frustrating. So the actual reality of working with Spark does contain quite a lot of frustration. Having said that, I do think it's still pretty awesome. Um, it's getting better. The APIs are getting pretty stable. It's being used in production all over the place. Uh, and if you want to process big data at scale, I recommend you have a look at Spark. 